Thank you for joining us this evening. And I wanted to say that October is Liver Cancer Awareness Month. We have three clinical experts who will address cancer prevention and liver health strategies, how diet can improve liver health and modern treatments for liver cancer. A few housekeeping issues before we start. All of the participants will be on mute throughout the program. If you have a question, we're asking that you please type it in the chat box down at the bottom of your screen in the right hand corner. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, given the amount of time we have when all three presentations are completed. I did want to also mention that tonight we will be covering general guidelines and recommendations. If you have specific medical questions or concerns, it's best to consult with your personal physician as they can address your individual needs. And lastly, for com the comprehensive bios on our speakers, you can go to the handout section of our presentation and take a look at them. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Su Wang. Dr. Wang is the medical director of the Center for Asian Health and the Viral Hepatitis Programs. Please go ahead, Dr. Wang. Thank you, Angela. I want to welcome everybody here. It's so great to have everybody here. I think this is such an important series we're doing for October, which is um, Liver Cancer Awareness Month. And it's a chance for us to really talk about how we can protect our liver, keep our livers healthy, and learn about some of the important um, liver diseases and uh, what to do if you do have a liver condition. So let me um, start my slides. All right, great. So today um, I'm gonna talk about liver disease basics and what you can do to be an advocate for your own liver. Uh, again, I am an internist and I do have a um, interest and focus on viral hepatitis and uh, preventing liver cancer. And I work at a St. Barnabas Medical Center in Florham Park and I'm part of the RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. I also serve as the president of the World Hepatitis Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization which seeks to um, harness the power of people living with viral hepatitis to see its elimination. All right, so what does the liver do? Um, we all know the liver is an important organ and it's actually the largest solid organ in our body. It weighs about three pounds and it's about the size of a football. And you can see the picture of it here. Um, it hangs out under your lungs on the right side of your body um, above your colon and your intestines. Um, so it's got an important job. It produces almost all the proteins that you need in your body. It creates the clotting factors, which help stop bleeding. It creates all the immune factors, which protect you from infections and help you get well when you do get sick. It also produces bile. You see the gallbladder there, the little green sac hanging underneath the liver. Um, and uh, it, in those bile, the, uh, the bile acid actually helps your body digest fats, vitamins, and nutrients. It's also really important as a filtering organ. Um, it clears away and it and excretes toxins, such as drugs, alcohol, and poisonous substances. And also it stores and releases energy. Almost all the vitamins and minerals um, and carbohydrates, proteins and fats are stored there and it slowly releases them as your body needs them. And so what can happen to the liver? There are a number of kind of like um, attacks that can happen. So we talk about um, acute liver disease, um, and what does that mean? So that means that it's a, a transient um, insult. So it's a insult that can cause transient hepatitis or inflammation. Um, it sometimes can cause an actual flare, um, and rarely, uh, but, but something to be concerned about, it can cause um, actual liver failure, um, some of these acute injuries. So what can these injuries come from? So it can come from alcohol, which is what we um, commonly can think about um, people who go into alcoholic hepatitis or go into alcoholic liver failure. Um, any of these hepatitis viruses can cause an acute infection. So you can have acute hepatitis A, acute hepatitis B, and acute hepatitis C often when you first get the infection. Um, and then there are a number of drugs that can cause hepatitis and almost any drug, but there are certain drugs that have a predilection for the liver. Um, and one of those is Tylenol or acetaminophen is the generic name. At high doses, it doesn't mean you can't take it, but in high doses and sometimes in combination with other medications, it's more likely to cause injury. Um, INH, which is a TB medication, 
um, uh, certain statins can cause an, uh, a mild elevation of uh, liver enzymes, but not necessarily um, liver injury, and that often goes away. And then there are often herbals and supplements that have been tied to liver damage. And so I always tell people that just because it's labeled as natural um, or just a supplement doesn't mean that it can't do damage. And so one of those things that we uh, talk about, and make sure people know, are like some certain kinds of green tea supplements, not green tea in itself, but in the supplements are highly concentrated amounts of green tea. And every year there's a handful of people who go into liver failure um, because they've taken too many of these uh, green tea concentrates you know, in an effort to lose weight or whatever. Um, and as I mentioned, there's often interactions uh, with herbals and supplements with prescription medications. So it's really important to let your doctor know if you're taking any of these things, because if they're prescribing you other medications, it's important for them to know, especially if they see any abnormalities in your liver enzymes, they can then try to figure out if it's related to something else that you're taking. So the good news is that the majority of these acute insults will self-resolve. Um, however, acute, severe acute hepatitis sometimes can require supportive care or hospitalization. Um, and if there's liver failure, it may actually warrant a liver transplant. So now we're gonna go into chronic liver disease. Um, and what does this mean? So chronic liver injuries can cause ongoing liver inflammation. Um, and what happens here is that there's an ongoing cycle of damage and repair. So um, the, 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 the liver is basically subjected to chronic damage and as it's trying to repair itself, it's creating a lot of additional collagen and other things inside the matrix of the liver. And over time, that just causes fibrosis. Um, and that can uh, lead to what we call, oh, that's basically essentially liver stiffness. And over time, that fibrosis can lead to cirrhosis or scarring. You see a picture of that on the right with a really like bumpy, irregular uh, surface of the liver. And cirrhosis um, can come in different degrees, so it's usually not re reversible. Early cirrhosis can have degrees of uh, regenerating and, and um, uh, improving. Um, and uh, people often are first in the stage of compensated cirrhosis, uh, where they're still able to maintain functions, make enough proteins. But at the end, the really end stage of liver disease, you get decompensated cirrhosis. And you often have people who have a lot of swelling in their belly. They may be jaundiced, uh, more likely, a lot more likely to bleed. Um, and that's really the, the end stage of liver disease they're trying to avoid. And cirrhosis itself can increase the risk of liver cancer um, because of that ongoing inflammation. Uh, you're basically causing a lot of cell turnover and you can get cancerous cells grow. Um, so I didn't go over what can cause chronic liver injuries, but it's essentially um, the same thing that can cause acute uh, in, uh, hepatitis, just out the alcohol, um, viruses, um, what's different is that you have the metabolic associated fatty liver disease, which I'm going to go into a little bit more detail next. Um, there's also other conditions uh, such as autoimmune hepatitis, which is when the body develops antibodies to the liver and certain gallbladder con disorders, um, which are more rare, but can also cause uh, liver damage. So how common is liver disease? Um, so unfortunately, there is low awareness of liver disease. So we're really you know, we think it's great that you're here and that you're trying to learn about liver disease because overall globally and even in America, there is low awareness of liver disease. October happens to be Breast Cancer Awareness Month and we've all heard about breast cancer and there's a number of talks and, and things happening for breast cancer, but liver disease is often not as celebrated or, you know, uh, there's not a lot of education that happens with it. So um, we are uh, glad to be here and, and glad that all of you guys are here. So liver disease is common though and uh, one of the, the most common conditions at this point is actually fatty liver disease. We think that up to 25% of Americans may have fatty liver disease, and that comes out to like almost 100 million Americans. Um, in terms of the other liver conditions, hep C, we think affects 3 million Americans, hep B, 2.2, alcohol-related cirrhosis, which is, you know, the more severe form of alcohol-related disease may affect up to 2 million individuals. Now, the concerning thing is that liver cancer is the sixth most common, most common cancer globally. And um, also concerning, it has a very high mortality rate, and it's the highest, third highest cause of cancer-related deaths. So um, it's often diagnosed late in stage, which is the problem. If you diagnose it earlier, there's more interventions we can do, um, but often it's not detected till much later. And uh, Dr. Langan will be talking more about liver cancer. Um, and as I mentioned, the cases are going up in the U.S. and globally. Liver cancer screening, unfortunately, is not done as regularly as breast, um, colon cancer, or prostate cancer. And that's something that I hope can impress on you is really important as well. 
in liver transplants um, in the US, about 40,000 people um, had liver transplants in 2019. So we're gonna talk about fatty liver disease and here's a picture of kind of what a fatty liver looks like. And you can see that basically there's been fatty infiltration of the liver. It has that yellowish um, hue to it. It's not bright red and burgundy color like a healthy liver. Um, and this is in the medical terminology, we call it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And some of the main contributors are a high fat, high starch diet and the sedentary lifestyle um, that we often have here in the US um, are major contributors. And what happens, it can, cause, it can lead to this path of chronic inflammation. And over time, non-alcoholic fatty liver, a subgroup of people will develop NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and this is more likely to develop into cirrhosis. Um, this is now the most common liver disease in the U.S. and quickly becoming, unfortunately, the number one cause of liver transplants, which before were um, largely due to alcohol and hepatitis C. So most of the people, almost 90% of people have a metabolic risk factor. So either obesity, type two diabetes, prediabetes even, and high blood pressure or high cholesterol. The majority of people with fatty liver are overweight, but lean fatty liver is an actual thing and it is quite common in Asians. Um, so what are the interventions that work? And this is study over study has really shown that it's all about lifestyle change, that exercise, weight loss, even five to 10% of weight loss can actually lead to regression of the fatty liver. Um, and it's really important to control those other contributory conditions such as diabetes and high cholesterol. So to be aggressive and make sure that you're actually on your medication and getting it checked and in good control um, of those conditions. And um, what treatments work? So there's no magic pill, unfortunately, um, right now, Oddly enough, vitamin E is the one thing that's been shown to work, and so we put a lot of patients on that. Um, there's been a recent medication, an injection called semaglutide, um, which has been shown to reduce some NASH uh, cases. And there are a number of others in clinical trials, but nothing that's really um, proven to be very effective. So it really does come down to lifestyle. So what can you do to be an advocate for your liver and to be healthy? Um, so I like to tell people, know your ABCs um, and make sure your doctor has tested you for these uh, conditions. I think we often think that you go to the doctor, they do a check, they kind of just check everything. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily the case. There's not one box that checks off, um, you know, all the lab tests that you need. So it's important to be an advocate and actually ask your physician if you've been screened for hepatitis A, B, or C. Um, and it can often seem like an alphabet soup, um, but just to kind of go, do a quick overview, Hepatitis A, you may have heard of recently, um, and, and oftentimes there'll be reports of outbreaks in restaurants um, because it happens through uh, contaminated food, during um, food, food preparation or at time of harvest. Um, it's basically food, fecal oral contamination, so that's why so much emphasis on food preparers washing their hands. Um, there is a vaccine, and it's now part of the childhood vaccine schedules, schedule. Um, for adults, however, the vaccine was traditionally given for travel. And so um, you may have gotten in if you were traveling, but a lot of people have actually not been given uh, the vaccine. So what I tell people is get tested and if you're not immune, get vaccinated. Past couple of years, the US has seen a number of epidemics, um, which at first affected the homeless population, but recently in, in New Jersey, it actually affected people who went to um, certain delis, um, even at certain country club, people were affected. So really doesn't, um, nobody's truly immune unless you are actually, you actually have the antibody. So and in terms of hep B and hep C, hep B is the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the world. It's transmitted through blood and bodily fluids. So not through food like hepatitis A. Um, in the world, the, the most common transition uh, uh, infection route is mother to child transmission during child childbirth. And that's why the hep B birth dose for infants is really important um, because we can stop that transmission um, if the babies all get vaccinated. For adults, a lot of us, if you were born after 1990, I mean, before 1991, um, you were not given this as a childhood vaccine. And so it's important for you to get tested and if you're not immune, you can still get vaccinated. So hep C is through blood transmission, um, including unsafe injections, drug use, and transfusions. Um, and now the CDC, as of last year, recommends a one-time hepatitis C test for all adults. It used to be just for, um, for, uh, for baby boomers. It used to be for people born between 1945 and 1965. But we saw us, we were seeing a surge of infections in the millennials in the 20s and 30s, largely driven by the opioid epidemic. So it's now um, recommended that all adults over 18 should have a one-time test. 
And uh, what's remarkable is we have cures now for hep C. So it's an eight to 12 week course of oral medication, almost 100% cure rate. So if you know you have hep C or you know somebody who's had it, now is the time to get cured because we can stop that cycle of inflammation um, and uh, decrease the risk of cirrhosis and uh, liver cancer. So what else can you do to be an advocate for your liver? Well, obviously protect it. Um, so limiting alcohol is really important. We know that there's a dose um, dependent uh, 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 rate for, for damage related to alcohol. Um, be aware of the herbals and supplements, as I mentioned, medication interactions, do the things to help prevent fatty liver um, and control those conditions that can lead to fatty liver, which I mentioned. So your doctor does do routine blood work, which includes liver function tests. Um, they're often part of a complete metabolic profile. Um, and uh, those, the liver enzymes we look at are what we call the aminotransferases or the AST or ALT, which you might see on your lab results. Um, alk alkaline phosphatase is also produced by the liver, GGT. Um, and other tests that could be abnormal if there's liver dys dysfunction, you might see issue, uh, issues with the bilirubin. It might be high, and that's what causes the jaundice. Um, your platelet count might be decreased. So oftentimes that's a sign of really severe liver um, dysfunction when the platelet count is low. Prothrombin time, that's a reflection of the clotting factors. If you're not making enough of those, your prothrombin time is long. That means that you're not uh, clotting in the right amount of time. And then another uh, test is lactate uh, dehydrogenase or LDH. So now if you've already been diagnosed with a liver condition, a chronic liver condition, what's, um, what should you do? It's really important to see your physician for regular follow-up. So if they tell you to get lab tests every six months, every three months, please do so. Sometimes I see patients who I told you know, to follow up every six months, they don't come back for another year or two years and we miss that window of time to intervene if I saw something that was abnormal. Um, imaging is really important. So ultrasounds we often order and now we're also ordering um, fiber scans or elastographies, and it's basically like an ultrasound, but it also measures liver stiffness. So it helps us look for fibrosis, um, cirrhosis, and actually the fiber scan can help look at fat content. Um, so that helps us confirm a diagnosis of fatty liver. Um, and this ongoing imaging is really important. So for my chronic uh, patients with chronic liver disease, people who are considered high risk for liver cancer need this every six months, six to 12 months in order to screen for liver cancer um, and also liver cirrhosis. So, and as I mentioned, just follow the recommendations and treatments. Sometimes it doesn't feel like we're always doing things if we're not giving you medication, but just know that your doctor is really paying close attention um, to your blood, uh, to your blood tests um, and monitoring you. Um, obviously avoid other, other liver toxins and the insults that I mentioned. Um, and then make sure you prevent other liver disease. So if you have fatty liver, um, it's important to get screened um, for hep A and hep B because you can get vaccinated and prevent another potential insult to your liver. And then I think it's really important to find peer support and resources to find people who are going through the same thing as you um, and can uh, be a support for you. So, and also learn, you know, I tell people to be active, be proactive and learn about the conditions that you have. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there. The American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, AASLD, um, has a lot of patient facing um, uh, educational materials um, and they have an annual liver meeting in November and they sure they actually have a patient track. So. Um, it's a very reduced registration fee, and there's a, we're designing a lot of the educational program for our patients, and so I'll be a part of uh, organizing those, um, that, patient, uh, that patient conference. The American Liver Foundation has resources. National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable has patients do a lot of advocacy. And then if you have Hep B, the Hep B Foundation has um, some great resources as well. So in just two seconds, you know, one of my, um, one of my passions is uh, viral hepatitis and it's something that we, uh, now is really the time for us to do more in. This is just kind of showing that we've ignored hepatitis. Um, and if you look at it, basically the deaths from hepatitis now exceed HIV, TB or malaria. And so if we don't do what we know we need to do in terms of screening and treating patients with hep uh, B and hep C, um, we're going to be seeing uh, the burden, the number of deaths from hep B and hep C exceed TB, HIV, and malaria all combined. And so it is time for us to, uh, to mount a global response to hepatitis, as Dr. Chan, who used to direct the WHO said. Um, and I just think it's important for us to cast this vision because we are all living in this era. I think about, you know, I tell people how we were able to eliminate smallpox, um, you know, through vaccines. 
same thing with hepatitis. We may be able to tell our kids that in our generation, we eliminated hepatitis so that they would not have to, to face it. Um, and this is something that, you know, I think it's important for the general population to know because these screening tests are recommended by CDC. They're actually covered by insurance. Um, and uh, so it's important to, to advocate for yourself and ask for those tests because the hep C is now curable um, and it should, all insurances cover it. Um, there may be some pre-authorization involved, but the, uh, we work with closely with a pharmacist. We have a pharmacist embedded in our practice who helps do all the, the, the pre-authorization work. Hep B, as I mentioned, is vaccine preventable. It's also treatable, and there are cures coming down the pipeline. So we think in the next five to 10 years, we'll have options where we're able to cure Hep B as well. But really, screening is the first step. If we don't find the missing millions, we won't be able to get people into care. And sadly, in the U.S., more than 50% of people living with Hep B and Hep C are still unaware of the infection. Um, and we we see that we see the the outcome of this. If people aren't diagnosed, then um, or treated, then basically what we see is that we get more people with liver cancer or the end, um, the end outcome. So 65% of liver, liver cancer in the US is still due to Hep B and Hep C. Um, and uh, this is something that the US has now said we can eliminate. And this was actually um, the conclusion um, announced by Dr. Brian Strom, who's the Chancellor of Rutgers, as you guys, as many of you know. Um, he was the chair of the US Hepatitis Elimination Committee. And he said, we now have the tools to eliminate hepatitis, but we will require significant resource allocation, commitment, and strategy. Um, and so we just want everybody to know at St. Barnabas Medical Center, we're committed to this vision. Um, our hospital, uh, both in the ED and inpatient, is doing hep B and hep screening for those who qualify. Um, and we're getting everybody we find who is positive into care, into our practice. And at this point, we've actually cured almost 100 people of hep C. Um, and a number of uh, people with Hep B were taken care of. So, and I just say everybody who's on this talk has been a really big, important part of this teamwork. Um, and uh, really honored to to be here with you all. And I'm happy to pass the baton on to Jill now. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for that terrific and informative overview on liver health and prevention strategies. I'm delighted to now welcome Jill Karima, registered dietitian for our cancer program at the St. Barnabas Medical Center. And Jill, please go ahead with your presentation. Do you have it there? Is it there? You got it right. Okay, good. Thank you, Angela. Um, I'm going to speak to you tonight about keeping your liver healthy with good nutrition. A key component to liver health is having a clean, whole food, anti-inflammatory diet. We're going to talk tonight about what dietary changes you could make to help lessen the inflammation in your system and keep your liver healthy. We are going to eat to beat inflammation. What do we want to limit? We want to limit our processed foods. Processed foods have added preservatives, chemicals, toxins in it. Such examples are canned foods, prepared foods, bacon, sausages, cold cuts. And all that adds stress to our liver in terms of metabolizing those. We want to limit our simple carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates um, break down very quickly in our system, which can lead to a spike in glucose, which can lead to an increase in uh, insulin, and which can lead to fatty liver as well. Such examples would be candies, you know, um, juices, sodas, frappuccinos. Really, if you're looking on um, an ingredient list, what you're looking for, you want to avoid anything that says high fructose corn syrup as well. That goes directly to the liver and can create fatty liver. We want to limit our red meat. So red meat is defined as any animal that walks on four legs. So not only is that cows, but that's also our pork and lamb as well. And there's a few reasons for this. The heme iron that is found in red meat has been shown to have a direct link to colorectal cancer. In addition, we know that red meat is an abundance of saturated fat and cholesterol, which can increase our cholesterol and increase our LDL and add to the fatty liver. We want to limit our saturated fats and our trans fats. Saturated fats you'll find in fried foods, meats, high fat dairy products, and trans fats have been added to foods to increase the shelf life. So many of our processed foods can often have trans fats in them. And what you're looking to what you're looking on the uh, ingredient list for that is if you see partially hydrogenated oils at all, it's a kind of a key to you that there might be trans fat and that you might want to put it back on the shelf. And alcohol, if you don't drink, don't start. And if you do, please uh, keep it in moderation. But it's not all about what to take out of the diet. What can you add to the diet to kind of um, make it a little bit more anti-inflammatory? Well, we definitely want to increase our complex carbohydrates. 
we want to increase our fiber. We're looking at about 30 grams of fiber a day is what we want. And the typical American diet can gets only about half of that. Fiber does a few things. A, it helps us feel full longer. So that helps if we're trying to control our weight. It helps us metabolize carbohydrates so that they break down a little bit more slowly in our diet. And it also helps us normalize our lipid levels. So it can help us reduce our cholesterol, um, reduce our LDL and increase HDL, which is that good cholesterol. Um, our good numbers, we're going to increase our fresh fruits and vegetables. We're going to talk about how you can, you know, we're asking you to kind of limit some of your meat, but we're going to talk to you about how you can now increase your plant based proteins. And very important is cooking with fresh herbs and spices, not the pill form fresh herbs and spices. We know that there are many out there that do have some anti inflammatory uh, responses to them. We have turmeric, cinnamon, garlic, ginger, just to name a few, and you really want to cook with them to get the, the most. The most benefit and the safest uh, way to do that. So that could be soups or stews, or you could throw a little turmeric in your morning smoothie, a little cinnamon in your steel cut oats are just examples of where you can start the day that way. So we do want to choose some complex carbohydrates. Now, what does that mean? We shouldn't be afraid of carbohydrates, but you want to choose the right ones. What you're looking for is 100% whole wheat. If you're looking at on, on the label. Um, in terms of a, a bread choice, a great option is a sprouted grain bread. Um, I think most people probably have heard of the brand Ezekiel bread, but many uh, companies out there now make their own. And basically what they do is they take organic uh, lentils and legumes and they sprout them. So they, they put them in a very temperature and moisture controlled environment, and then they sprout and then they blend them into their bread product. And what the result is, is really a very hearty, High fiber, high protein, rich in omega 3 fatty acid type of bread. So, um, next time you're at the store, take a look for those. Now, we, when we're looking at our complex carbohydrates, let's say at dinner, we might be used to having white rice, white potatoes, regular pastas, and we really want to try and swap those out a little bit. So, brown rice is a great option, barley, couscous, wheat berries. Um, there's many, many out there you can try. You want to swap maybe that baked potato, you know, sw swap in a sweet potato for the baked potato for some added fiber and nutrition and quinoa. Quinoa is really a superfood. It is um, a complex carbohydrate. It offers you fiber, protein, omega-3 fatty acids. It is a complete protein, which means it has all the essential amino acids in it. And it is gluten free. So just to speak about gluten for a moment, gluten is the protein found in wheat products. And it has been shown um, that diets high in gluten can maybe have um, a result in a high inflammation in your system. So many of my patients come to me and they're, lo they're looking to either uh, reduce or eliminate a lot of gluten in their diet. And quinoa is a wonderful opportunity to do that. Plant-based pasta, I tell all my patients, slow down when you go down the pasta aisle. We get very used to kind of what pasta we grew up on, but there really is a wonderful variety um, that is offered now in terms of plant-based pastas from red lentil to edamame to quinoa to chickpea pasta. Um, and I always tell them, I said, just try a new one every week to see what you like. Um, but portion size does matter. You can have too much of a good thing. So about a half a cup cooked rice, potato or pasta is really the serving size that you're looking for. So we've now asked you to kind of limit some of those animal based proteins. So where are we going to get a protein from? Well, we're going to look really towards our plant-based proteins. I'd say the most common one that people think of is our legumes and our lentils, right? Our, our beans, our chickpeas, our soybeans, our black beans, red beans. You do want to have the non-canned version. You want to have them fresh and you want to rotate them. You're going to get a different nutrition profile from each different bean. Um, you also don't have to think about them just in terms of like a dinner option. They're a great snack option as well. So I often, I love hummus. I think hummus is a great plant-based protein, high in fiber. There's tahini in it, which is a rich source of vitamin E, which has been shown to help lower inflammation in your system as well. Um, I take chickpeas and I will roast them about 400 degrees for about 20, 25 minutes. I put a little garlic powder, a little cayenne pepper, and they're a great substitute for those highly processed croutons that we like to put in our salad. So I'll keep them and I'll throw maybe a third cup into my salad and it gives me some fiber, some protein, um, and, a, and a healthier crunch than the crouton did. Uh, nuts and seeds are a good option. Um, again, similar to that of the beans, you want to rotate those. You're going to get different nutrition from different nuts and seeds. For example, uh, in terms of almonds, you're a good source of calcium. Omega-3 fatty acids are going to be very rich in your walnuts, your flax seeds, your chia seeds, your hemp seeds. Um, vitamin E and selenium you can find in sunflower seeds. 
magnesium and manganese, which can be difficult to find. You can find in Brazil nuts. So you really do want to kind of rotate them to really uh, get all the nutrition you can. But portion size matters, and you're looking for about an ounce is considered the portion size. Uh, we have nut butters as well. You know, we grew up maybe just on peanut butter, but now we know that there's cashew butter, sunflower butter, almond butter. Um, the serving size is about a tablespoon, and that would go great with that sprouted grain bread as an afternoon snack. Um, we did talk about quinoa, and we, um, and we did talk about the plant-based protein pastas, but I also encourage you to think not just about dinner time with those, because um, they're great options to make a meatless dinner option, but I tend to make a little extra, then I'll put them in my fridge, and I'll keep, they keep about up to four days pretty, pretty nicely in the refrigerator, and I'll, when I'm having my salad at lunch, I'll take maybe a third cup cooked, and I'll kind of toss it in, in my salad for a nice plant-based uh, approach to, uh, to your salad. So dairy free alternatives, um, this is similar to the gluten. Uh, the, the protein that is found in cow's milk, specifically casein has been linked to increased inflammation in our system. So again, many of our patients come to us and they're looking to uh, either eliminate or significantly lower the amount of dairy in their diet. It is much easier now. Um, there are many, many options and they're really easily available in most stores. In terms of the beverage side, you're looking at um, almond milk, cashew milk, hemp milk, pea plant protein milk, almond, uh, oat milk I have. You do want to choose the unsweetened variety because many of these can have added sugars, which obviously we are trying to avoid because increased sugar will lead to the inf increased inflammation. Um, you know, we grew up and I think we always thought of, you know, you have to have milk, you know, two, three times a day to get your calcium, keep your bones strong. But what we learned is that almond milk has twice the amount of calcium. So you have two glasses of that a day and uh, you've pretty much almost met your calcium requirements. Um, they're great for cereal, coffee, smoothies. It's a great option if you're, if you're having a more morning smoothie um, and cooking as well. It can be substituted in uh, for like any type of heavy cream. I, I also tell you that you can take this a step further. Um, the yogurt varieties in there too. There are so, so many um, when, you, when you head to the yogurt area. They have uh, you know, the almond version, the coconut version, the pea plant version as well. Um, and even a little further is, you know, most people have a hard time letting go of cheese, you know, but we know specifically with the, with the sodium in it and the saturated fat content of it, um, they do now have dairy free cheeses out there. And there are quite a few different companies that will make them as well. Fresh fruits, and we're talking about carbohydrates and complex carbs. We need fruit in our diet. Um, we do metabolize it fairly well uh, because of the fiber content in it. You want fresh fruit or frozen fruit not canned or juiced. When we're looking at what fruits to kind of choose, you might have heard of the lower glycemic index, especially if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic. Lower, lower glycemic index speaks to the how quickly the fruit or the food will break down in our system. So the higher the glycemic index, the quicker uh, the food breaks down, which can result in that spike in glucose, which we're trying to avoid. So we do tend to encourage lower glycemic index fruits. Some examples would be apples, strawberries, blueberries, um, raspberries, cherries. But regardless of the glycemic index, I think most importantly with fruits is that you have to really take care of the portion size. Um, for example, bananas are kind of dense, so it's about a half a half a banana or about a four inch portion. Berries you can get a, a little more volume with, or about a cup. Uh, edible fruits, you know, if you're looking at apples or oranges, nectarines or pears, you want to compare it to the size of about a tennis ball. So not a softball, but about a tennis ball. So um, all fruits are good for you, but you do really want to pay attention to the portion size. Um, you also want to enjoy the protein, you know, enjoy your fruit with a protein for the best uh, metabolic effect in our system. So in other words, have that apple, maybe with that tablespoon of nut butter. We'll metabolize that even a little bit more slowly, again, preventing that spike in, in blood sugar that we're trying to avoid. Vegetables. The anti-inflammatory diet focuses, centers around our vegetable intake. Um, you've probably heard the expression, follow the rainbow. And that really speaks to the fact that you need a variety of colored vegetables to really meet all of your needs. Every color is gonna give you a different, you know, phytonutrient, phytochemical that can be helpful in your system. For example, the greens like the Swiss chard, the kale, the spinach, the dandelion greens, they're gonna be a really good source of, you know, calcium, iron, B-complex, folate, uh, your, your oranges and your yellows, you know, those are gonna be your beta carotenes, that's your, you know, your, your peppers and your, and your carrots. 
Um, your purples and your blues are very important as well. So you're looking at blueberries, beets, pomegranates. Um, those are, those are going to be very good sources of polyphenols, which have shown to have significant anti-inflammatory uh, assistance in our in our bodies. So what you're looking for is the number five. You want five cups total of fruits and vegetables a day, and that's pretty much about a cup, cup and a half of those fresh fruits, and about three and a half to four cups of fresh vegetables a day. And to do that, you almost you really can't just think about it at dinner. You have to kind of wake up and start thinking about it at that first first meal of the day at breakfast. So if you're having maybe an egg or egg white scramble, you really want to throw some tomatoes in it, peppers in it, some veggies from the night before is fine. Um, if you're having that smoothie, throw a cup of organic spinach in there. You'll know you'll get a serving there as well. Um, maybe then you head into lunch, so you have that nice hearty salad. And now uh, even snacks. So if you're having that hummus, you want to do it maybe with some cut up fresh vegetables as well. So you really have to kind of think about it throughout the day. And then dinner time, half your, your plate should be either fresh or frozen vegetables. Um, you do want to choose non-starchy ones. That's just asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, you know, your, your greens. I will talk to you a second about about salads. I think we kind of get very used to the, the salads that we just kind of used to having, like maybe romaine. But really slow down when you're in the produce section because they have some wonderful super green ba bags out there. Well, that will combine kale, um, Brussels sprouts in there, you know, dandelion greens. Really, that uh, combination of vegetables that can give you a, a lot more nutrition than just the romaine that maybe we're used to having. Now, if you're looking to reduce your caloric intake and lose some weight, the rice cauliflower and rice broccoli, as well as zucchini spirals, are a fabulous opportunity to do it. They have such a high water content that they will really pull in any sauce or spices that maybe you're cooking around that. Um, so I highly encourage you to, to, to give that a try as well. So, and then lastly, we're talking about fats. Healthy fats are a very important part of your diet. They're good for brain health, they help us uh, absorb our fat soluble vitamins, the ADE and the Ks, they help us feel full, but the type of fat really, really matters. Um, you really want to increase your monounsaturated fatty acids. That's your, you know, your, your olives, your avocado, your avocado oils, polyunsaturated fatty acids, right? That's your omega threes. That's your uh, chia seeds, your flax seeds, your hemp seeds, your, your walnuts, um, a great oil to use, you know, in terms of even salads, if you're trying to really increase your omega three fatty acids, would be to use either flax or walnut oil as well. You can cook with avocado oil. So I think you know using the right amount of fats in your diet is very important. In addition to fatty fish, if you choose to have fish in your diet, wild Alaskan salmon, um, albacore tuna, mackerel are all good sources and you'd wanna do that about twice a week. But be careful because serving size matters for this too. About a, about a teaspoon of oil is equivalent to 45 calories. So that can add up pretty quickly. And then lastly, is some helpful resources. So www.eatright.org is the American Dietetic Association. Um, this is you can go to for a whole bunch of great nutrition information. And specifically, you can search out um, a dietitian in your area. I highly recommend if you're looking to make these dietary changes that you sit with a health professional, a registered dietitian, he or she then can actually go through your past medical history, any medications you're on, take a look at your lab values, maybe any hurdles that you've had in the past, um, and together make an individualized plan that will work for you. Um, cookieandcake.com is a great website. I send all my patients to. Um, Kate is the chef and Cookie's her dog. That's where the name comes from. And she has a wonderful, uh, they're all anti-inflammatory, vegetarian-based uh, recipes out there, and she updates them every other day. So there it's it's really a great it's where I get most of my recipes truthfully. And then two really good books. The Skinny Liver book I find is very good. It's user friendly. It builds upon what, you know, we're speaking about today, not even just the nutrition side of it, how to reduce you know, um everyday toxins in your system to lower your inflammation. It talks about exercise, which is very very important. You're looking for at least 45 minutes 5 times a week of some type of good aerobic exercise. But she also does speak about the benefits of de-stressing in terms of even like yoga. So I think that's a fantastic book that um, was really user-friendly. And then Eating Clean. So Eating Clean is a little step further. That is a vegan book, anti-inflammatory vegan book. 
But for example, if you wanted to maybe learn how to make some of those dairy free beverages at home in your own kitchen or dairy free cheeses, you can do that in your own kitchen, which will be um, always the least processed way to do it. So those are just some four uh, helpful resources to help you further uh, what we've talked about today. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, for that wonderful overview and for those very specific nutrition guidelines. It's always inspiring to hear you talk about food and how easy it is. And I, I think everybody out there would agree with me that it is always a challenge. So those resources are great. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Russell Langan. Dr. Langan is chief surgical, is chief of surgical oncology and hepatopancreobiliary surgery at St. Barnabas Medical Center and is a surgical oncologist at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Please go ahead, Dr. Langan. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for taking some time uh, to learn more about liver disease. And now we're gonna move into uh, treatments for liver uh, cancers. Uh, I do lead the surgical program on this particular campus. Uh, we do have a uh, affiliation with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey and I hold a professorship uh, through Rutgers. Uh, I do have uh, two disclosures. I sit on uh, advisory boards for medical technology companies. So the first thing I wanted to uh, really address is the fact that here on this campus at St. Barnabas Medical Center, we truly have a comprehensive liver center. Uh, and that means that we have uh, surgeons uh, one that can complete uh, complex liver surgeries uh, and at times uh, use minimally invasive techniques like laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery. Uh, we have an intimate relationship with the liver transplant team that's based at a university hospital. Those surgeons are on this campus uh, often uh, as well. Uh, we have hepatologists and interventional gastroenterologists that focus uh, on liver patients interventional radiologists to do complex liver procedures and patients that uh, do not move towards liver transplant or liver surgery, uh, radiation oncologists that can now use CyberKnife uh, focused into the liver, medical oncologists that um, have uh, based their careers around treating gastrointestinal and, and liver uh, malignancies, and of course, nutritional and psychosocial support services. We are a comprehensive liver center and our group really is the highest volume liver surgery group uh, for the state uh, of New Jersey. Um, our surgical team here uh, on this particular campus, on the Livingston campus, is myself and Dr. Jason Maggi. We are both surgical oncologists. We are fellowship trained and board certified in surgical oncology and have practices that uh, focus uh, on liver as well as some other gastrointestinal uh, cancers. Uh, and then there are three liver transplant surgeons that spend time on this campus, Dr. James Guerrera, Dr. Flavio Paterno, and Dr. Will Boyan, uh, based out of the Liver Transplant Center at uh, University Hospital. So treatments for liver cancer. Um, you heard earlier in this session about preventative measures um, for liver cancer and, and nutritional measures to protect your liver. But what if uh, a patient does develop a liver cancer? Well, the way we look at liver cancer, when I say liver cancer, I mean a cancer that actually started within a liver cell, not a cancer that started in another part of the body and spread to the liver. I will address that later in this talk. But what if you had a, a cancer that started in the liver? We call that hepatocellular cancer or liver cancer. Well, first and foremost, we assess whether a patient is a candidate for transplantation. So just because you're seeing uh, myself or one of my partners here on this campus, uh, we will ensure that if a patient meets transplant criteria, uh, we set them up for formal transplant evaluation. We have a direct relationship with the transplant team, and we consider ourselves to be one liver surgery team for the state and for the healthcare network. If a patient is not a liver transplant candidate or, whether, or if they're not interested in undergoing liver transplantation, we then offer surgical resection, meaning to bring the patient to the operating room and remove uh, that liver tumor. If we're not going to operate, if the disease is too extensive uh, or if surgery just is, is not safe for that particular patient, the next thing that we can offer here on this campus uh, is embolization. 
And that is done through our interventional radiologists. They are part of our comprehensive liver center. They can do chemo embolization where small catheters are placed through an artery in the groin up into the liver, into the tumor, and the, the liver beads that have chemotherapy then directly to the tumor. We can do radiation embolization, which is a more modern form of using beads that have radiation in them into the tumor. And then we could also just stop blood supply uh, into liver tumors, which we call bland embolization. We can also do ablation. That would mean putting a needle into a liver tumor and heating it to kill that tumor. And nowadays we use a microwave machine for that or cryoablation at times, either done in the operating room or performed by our interventional radiologists. As I mentioned earlier, we can use CyberKnife therapy uh, delivered by our radiation oncologists into the liver to focus radiation in a modern way to treat a liver cancer. And then, of course, we have uh, expert medical oncologists to deliver medical therapeutics for liver cancer. Believe it or not, we do not use chemotherapy for liver cancer. There are newer agents, there are immunotherapy agents or uh, drugs, which we call tyrosine kinase inhibitors that stop the pathway uh, of a liver tumor. Um, and we are one team and address each patient in a multidisciplinary fashion to go through each uh, of these options and find the option that is best for that particular patient. We also have access to novel clinical trials. This is one particular trial that is currently open. It's based out of the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, uh, accruing in both in New Brunswick as well as uh, this campus. Um, it is called the Emerald II trial. It is a, a, a clinical trial for patients that have a liver cancer that either had that liver cancer removed or burned, uh, and then giving them new, novel, modern drugs to prevent recurrence. Currently, within the guidelines, there are no approved therapies to treat patients to try and prevent recurrence of liver cancer. It is something that is just absolutely needed. We use it in other areas of the body, and this clinical trial um, offers patients a very novel and exciting way to prevent uh, recurrence of liver cancer after it has been treated. Um, I'm going to briefly now just move into a different disease site, colorectal cancer. And the reason I'm doing that is uh, within the United States, you can see from this particular table, which is a new table, uh, colon and rectal cancers represent a significant portion of new cancer diagnoses and a significant portion of cancer deaths in the U.S. Uh, the National Cancer Institute estimates that 150,000 new colorectal cancer cases will be um, found here in the United States in 2020. 20% of those cases will have disease that has already spread at the time they um, are found. And half of all patients, 50% of patients, um, will have the, the liver involved um, from, from colon cancer. And the, the question we ask as oncologists is, uh, can we cure these patients? And, and interestingly, um, for, for colon cancer that has spread to the liver, there is a chance for cure. It's absolutely amazing and it's exciting. And you can cure a patient with stage four metastatic colon cancer uh, with liver metastasis. Um, to briefly overview how we would look at a patient with uh, metastatic colon cancer within the liver, we again use multidisciplinary team-based tumor board uh, conferences uh, and assess that patient as an individual and look to see whether it can be surgically removed. Uh, I'm also going to touch on a therapy called hepatic arterial infusion pump therapy. That is a therapy that was popularized by Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, my former institution, and um, St. Barnabas Medical Center and Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in coordination with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. We will be the two only centers uh, in the state of New Jersey to offer this particular therapy this coming year. Um, we can burn tumors uh, in the liver uh, when they're of colon origin. And of course, we can use chemotherapy and at times uh, radiation embolization. All of those offered here on our campus. Um, I just have to show this every time I give a liver talk. It's just fascinating. This is a picture of uh, Prometheus from um, from Greek god times, and this is a picture of Prometheus who is being punished by Zeus in the form of an eagle. 
that would come down daily and eat his liver uh, and his liver would regenerate. And this is amazing that thousands of years ago, the theory of liver regeneration um, was around. And that's very important for liver surgeons because for us to perform large complex liver surgeries, we have to have the liver uh, grow after surgery. And this is uh, a picture you'll see on the screen of a preoperative segment of liver that was planned to be left behind. And then six weeks after surgery, it grew into this large, healthy piece of liver. Um, surgical resection, removing tumors from the liver um, uh, is the, the recommended choice by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network for patients with colon cancer that spread into the liver. So why is that statement made? Well, this is a publication by a former mentor of mine from Sloan Kettering Cancer Center that found that patients can be cured. Cure is something that you can strive for in this patient population. That in patients that had colon cancer spread into their liver and they were stage four patients, uh, if we were able to remove those tumors, um, 55% of those patients uh, were alive at five years and 25% and were cured. They were alive at 10 years and they had no recurrence after that. Traditionally, uh, resection criteria were limited um, to uh, only a few tumors, small tumors only, had to get a big margin with no disease outside the liver, but data uh, and, and medical technology and publications, uh, that is, shown all those things to not be true. The, the way we approach the liver now really is different than uh, dogma and, and historical um, controls. So the way we approach the liver now is to assess whether we can leave a healthy segment of liver, can we clear the tumor from the liver, uh, and can we leave a large enough uh, you know, segment of liver for that patient to have a healthy life. Um, at times, patients have too much tumor in the liver to take them immediately to the operating room. So we use novel strategies of giving them chemotherapy first or giving them chemotherapy through a hepatic arterial infusion pump. This is an example of a patient that had very large tumors within the liver that you can see here that are in the dark gray, the normal liver is in the lighter gray. And after significant chemotherapy on the lower portion of the screen, you can see those tumors drastically came down in size and those were removed. Um, this is an image of the hepatic arterial infusion pump therapy. Again, uh, this institution and our sister institution in New Brunswick uh, will be placing these in in the coming year. Um, this is uh, an image of the liver with tumors within it. This is the artery that supplies blood into the liver. And there is a, a sister artery that lives off of this. We're able to place a catheter into that smaller artery that then can deliver chemotherapy um, directly into the liver and directly to liver tumors. Liver tumors are supplied solely by the artery. The pump itself is about the size of a hockey puck and it is placed in the abdominal wall. The catheter then moves into the abdominal cavity, into the hepatic artery, and will deliver chemotherapy directly into the liver and those tumors. This is a seminal publication by Dr. Kemeny from uh, Sloan Kettering. Um, that showed, okay, this is called a waterfall plot. I know I'm getting a little technical, but I'm gonna do this for a minute. Uh, in this waterfall plot, that patients that were treated with hepatic arterial infusion pump therapy, um, this represents a, a complete response, their tumor being completely gone, okay? And you can see through this, a just a dramatic tumor effect uh, when, when hepatic arterial infusion pump therapy is given to a patient with metastatic colorectal cancer to the liver. Um, uh, this is an example of a former patient of mine where we did this, and um, they had large volume tumor within the liver. They were given hepatic arterial infusion pump therapy uh, and came down to have uh, almost no tumor in the liver. Uh, this is something that truly does work. Here's another example of what I call multidisciplinary care, putting a team together in combination with chemotherapy, and hepatic arterial infusion pump therapy, uh, we can take large tumor burden, like these large gray areas here, uh, and treat them. And these livers can have dramatic responses. And then we can remove the residual tumor and cure those patients uh, of their disease. So colon cancer remains um, uh, prevalent within the United States. Metastatic colon cancer, stage four colon cancer to the liver. Um, 
remains a rate limiting step to patient survival. And we have to be aggressive with it and we need to be modern with it. We can cure it and we are working on improving those cure rates with newer therapies such as immunotherapies. Um, we offer all modern therapies here on this particular campus and within our healthcare network. And we actually had an immunotherapy clinical trial open that I was the principal investigator on that recently just closed uh, due to the sponsor. Um, so we are looking into modern uh, ways to to treat liver disease. Uh, this is the team. Uh, we have teams based here, uh, the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and then uh, University Hospitals, our liver transplant center. And there's my information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Langan, for that wonderful presentation and such comprehensive overview of all the services that we can provide here at St. Barnabas for the treatment of liver cancer. I'm looking now at the chat room and we have a few questions. One question that came in, and I think we'll ask Dr. Wong and then maybe you, Dr. Langan, if you have anything. What does liver cancer screening consist of? And I know we touched on it briefly, but maybe if we could revisit that. Sure, Angela, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think of it a little bit like um, mammograms where we recommend people get yearly mammograms after a certain age. Um, you may not feel anything, you don't have symptoms, your lab results may be fine You know, if you have a liver condition. But we recommend uh, liver cancer surveillance for people who are considered high risk. And um, I talked about the imaging, but there's also a test called alpha beta protein, um, which is not perfect, but it's some indicator that we have. And so it's a combination of getting the AFP plus your liver imaging modality every six months. Um, we generally do ultrasound, but in certain conditions, if you already have fatty liver, sometimes it's difficult to um, see new changes or nodules. And so we may recommend a CT or MRI um, every other year or um, instead of the ultrasound. Uh, and so those are, so the, and this is something you would work with your doctor to, to decide on the best, um, the best modality. How about you, Dr. Langan? Did you want to add anything? Yes, I'll, I'll just um, uh, take a little bit of a different spin on it. So um, if you've had um, a cancer and, and, and there are certain cancers that require Surveillance and there are surveillance guidelines given to us by um, uh, national uh, comprehensive guidelines. Uh, your liver needs to be watched, and typically we do that with imaging, CAT scans, MRI, at times PET scan. Um, in particular, of course, colon cancer is, is, is one. There are other cancers, of course, that require surveillance. I just use that as an example. Um, but yes, if you have um, risk factors, um, as Dr. Wang mentioned, um, those livers should be surveyed. The patient should, you know, seek to be part of our surveillance, uh, you know, program. And certainly, if you have a cancer, um, they need to be followed per guidelines. Thank you. And I have a question for you, Jill. Yes. If you don't like many veggies, <laughs> will supplements be sufficient? Um. No, I really feel like <laughs> you got to get out there and try them. I just gave you a whole bunch. Uh, you're not going to get get all the same benefits from a, a pill form as you will from the fiber and the phytonutrients. There's a synergy that those fresh fruits and vegetables will give you when you're you're consuming them fresh. To be honest with you, and you have to be careful with some of the pill forms because you don't really know all the time what's in them. So they can interact with any type of medication or treatment that you might be on. Thank you. Thank you. So, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of the hour. I did want to thank our speakers again, Dr. Su Wong, Jill Creamer, and Dr. Russ Langen for their well thought and informative presentations. If you have questions or concerns related to the information that was presented tonight, we encourage you to reach out to the Liver Center by calling 973 322 6777. And we thank you for participating tonight and have a wonderful evening.